The Things They Carried, Chapter 15, Part 2. Even in late afternoon, the day was hot. He turned on the air conditioner, then the radio, and he leaned back and let the cold air and music blow over him. Along the road, kicking stones in front of them, two young boys were hiking with knapsacks and toy rifles and canteens. He honked going by, but neither boy looked up. Already he had passed them six times, 42 miles, nearly three hours without stop. He watched the boys recede in his rearview mirror. They turned a soft brownish color, like sand, before finally disappearing. He tapped down lightly on the accelerator. Out on the lake, a man's motorboat had stalled. The man was bent over the engine with a wrench and a frown. Beyond the stalled boats, there were other boats, and a few water skiers, and the smooth July waters, and an immense flatness everywhere. Two mud hens floated stiffly beside a white dock. The road curved west, where the sun had now dipped low. He figured it was close to five o'clock. Twenty-five after, he guessed. The war had taught him to tell time without clocks. And even at night, waking from sleep, he could usually place it within ten minutes either way. What he should do now, he thought, is stop at Sally's house and impress her with this new time-telling trick of his. They'd talk for a while, catching up on things, and then he'd say, Well, better hit the road, it's 534. And she'd glance at her wristwatch and say, Hey, how did you do that? And he'd give a casual shrug and tell her it was just one of those things you pick up. He'd keep it light. He wouldn't say anything about anything. How is it being married? He might ask. And he'd nod at whatever she answered with. And he would not say a word about how he'd almost won the Silver Star for Valor. He drove past Slater Park and across the causeway and past Sunset Park. The radio announcer sounded tired. The temperature in Des Moines was 81 degrees, and the time was 535, and all you on the road drive extra careful now on this fine 4th of July. If Sally had not been married, or if his father were not such a baseball fan, it would have been a good time to talk. The Silver Star, his father might have said. Yes, but I didn't get it. Almost, but not quite. And his father would have nodded, knowing full well that many brave men do not win medals for their bravery, and that others win medals for doing nothing. As a starting point, maybe, Norman Bowker might have then listed the seven medals he did win. The Combat Infantryman's Badge. The Air Medal. The Army Commendation Medal. The Good Conduct Medal. The Vietnam Campaign Medal. The Bronze Star and the Purple Heart though his wound was minor and did not leave a scar and did not hurt and never had. He would have explained to his father that none of these decorations was for uncommon valor. They were just for common valor, the routine, daily stuff. Just humping, just enduring. But that was worth something, wasn't it? Yes, it was. Worth plenty. The ribbons looked good on the uniform in his closet. And if his father were to ask, he would have explained what each signified and how he was proud of all of them, especially the Combat inf Infantryman's Badge, because it meant he had been there as a real soldier and had done all the things soldiers do, and therefore it wasn't such a big deal that he could not bring himself to be uncommonly brave. And then he would have talked about the medal he did not win and why he did not win it. I almost won the Silver Star, he would have said, how is that? Just a story. So tell me, his father would have said. Slowly then, circling the lake, Norman Bowker would have started by describing the Song Trabong. A river, he would have said, the slow, flat, muddy river. He would have explained how during the dry season, it was exactly like any other river, nothing special but how in October the monsoons began and the whole situation changed. For a solid week, the rains never stopped, not once. 
And so after a few days, the Song Trabong overflowed its banks, and the land turned into deep, thick mud for a quarter mile on either side. Just muck. No other word for it. Like quicksand, almost, except the stink was incredible. He couldn't even sleep, he'd tell his father. At night, you'd find a high spot and you'd doze off, but then later you'd wake up because you'd be buried up in all that slime. You'd just sink in. You'd feel it ooze up over your body and sort of suck you down. And the whole time there was that constant rain. I mean, it never stopped. Not ever. Sounds pretty wet, his father would have said, pausing briefly. So what happened? You really want to hear this? Hey, I'm your father. Norman Bowker smiled. He looked out across the lake and imagined the feel of his tongue against the truth. Well, this one time, this one night out by the river, I wasn't very brave. You have seven medals. Sure. Seven. Count them. You weren't a coward either. Well, maybe not. But I had the chance, and I blew it. That stink, that's what got to me. I couldn't take that goddamn awful smell. Hey, if you don't want to say more, I do want to. All right, then. Slow and sweet. Take your time. The road descended into the outskirts of town, turning northwest past the junior college and the tennis courts, then past Chautauqua Park, where the picnic tables were spread with sheets of colored plastic, and where picnickers sat in lawn chairs and listened to the high school band playing Sousa March under the band shell. The music faded after a few blocks. He drove beneath a canopy of elms, then along a stretch of open shore, then past the municipal docks where a woman in pedal pushers stood casting for bullheads. There were no other fish in the lake except for perch and a few worthless carp. It was a bad lake for swimming and fishing both. He drove slowly. No hurry, nowhere to go. Inside the Chevy, the air was cool and oily smelling, and he took pleasure in the steady sounds of the engine and air conditioning. A tour bus feeling, in a way. Except the town he was touring seemed dead. Through the windows, as if in stop-motion photography, the place looked as if it had been hit by nerve gas. Everything still and lifeless, even the people. The town could not talk and would not listen. How'd you like to hear about the war? He might have asked, but the place could only blink and shrug. It had no memory, therefore no guilt. The taxes got paid and the votes got counted and the agencies of government did their work briskly and politely. It was a brisk, polite town. It did not know shit about shit and did not care to know. Norman Bowker leaned back and considered what he might have said on the subject. He knew shit. It was his specialty. The smell, in particular, but also the numerous varieties of texture and taste. Someday he'd give a lecture on the topic, put on a suit, a tie, and stand up front in front of the Kiwanis Club and tell the fuckers all about all the wonderful shit he knew. Pass out samples, maybe. Smiling at this, he clamped the steering wheel slightly right of center, which produced a smooth clockwise motion around the curve of the road. The Chevy seemed to know its own way. The sun was lower now. 5.45, he decided. Six o'clock stops. Along an unusual rail spur, four workmen labored in the shadowy red heat, setting up a platform in steel launchers for the evening fireworks. They were dressed alike in khaki trousers and work shirts, visored caps and brown boots. Their faces were dark and smudgy. Want to hear about the silver star I almost won? Norman Bowker whispered. But none of the workmen looked up. Later, they would blow color into the sky. The lake would sparkle with reds and blues and greens like a mirror, and the picnickers would make low sounds of appreciation. Well, see, it never stopped raining, he would have said. The muck was everywhere, 
You couldn't get away from it. He would have paused for a second. Then he would have told about the night they bivouacked in a field alongside the Song Trabong, a big swampy field beside the river. There was a village nearby, 50 meters downstream, and right away a dozen old mamasans ran out and started yelling. A crazy scene, he would have said. The mamasans just stood there in the rain, soaking wet, yapping away about how the field was bad news. Number 10, they said, evil ground. Not a good spot for good GIs. Finally, Lieutenant Jimmy Cross had to get out his pistol and fire off a few rounds just to shoo them away. By then, it was almost dark. So they set up a perimeter, ate chow, and crawled under their ponchos and tried to settle in for the night. But the rain kept getting worse. And by midnight, the field turned into soup. Just this deep, oozy soup, he would have said like sewage or something. Thick and mushy. You couldn't sleep. You couldn't even lie down, not for long, because you'd start to sink into the soup. Real clammy. You could feel the crud coming up inside your boots and pants. Here, Norman Bowker would have squinted against the low sun. He would have kept his voice cool, no self-pity. But the worst part, he would have said quietly, was the smell. Partly it was the river, a dead fish smell. But it was something else, too. Finally, somebody figured it out. What this was, it was a shit field. The village toilet. No indoor plumbing, right? So they used the field. I mean, we were camped in a goddamn shit field. He imagined Sally Kramer closing her eyes. If she were here with him in the car, she would have said, Stop it. I don't like that word. That's what it was. All right, but you don't have to use that word. Fine. What should we call it? She would have glared at him. I don't know. Just stop it. <laughs>